I had a hard time coming up with a title, and so I, powerful prayer is what I gave to um, Kathy. This morning's message is called Big God. I hope you can see the letters. There's a reason why. Um, this morning, we're going to hear time and time again this question, how big is your God? How big is your God? Because prayer reveals the size of our God. Some questions for you. How big is your God? For some individuals, God is the size of a car spare donut. It's about this size. What that means is that God, I mean, what is the only time you're going to use a donut? When, when is the only time you're going to use it? Emergencies. So for many people, their prayers reflect that God to them is as big as a spare donut. He's only there for emergencies. At all other times, you can tuck him safely and securely in your trunk until the next time you need him. Throughout this message this morning, the Holy Spirit is going to be interacting with me and you, asking us this question, how big is my God? Is my God the size of a donut, of a car, spare tire? Is my prayer life indicative that only at crises, only at emergencies, then I pray. Does my prayer life reveal that God, the God that I pray to, is this size? Because he's only useful for me when there's an emergency. For other Christians, we'll say, well, no, no, I, God for me is not even the regular tires. God for me is the car. I'm not the donut Christian. I am the car Christian. I believe that there's things that only I can do with God. And God can make me do things that I could not do by myself, but I am in the steering wheel. I use God to take me to where I want to go. God is there to guide, to provide for me the means to get to where I want to go. I couldn't, you know, get from here to Pennsylvania by foot, at least not, I could, I guess, but it would take a month. But with a vehicle, it takes 10 hours. And so I believe in God, and I believe that I can do things with God that I couldn't do on my own, but the things that I want to do are my own things. So some Christians have the donut, some Christians have the car, and some Christians will say, oh, ho, 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 those poor Christians, the donut Christians. The only when there's an emergency. Oh, I'm not like them. I'm certainly not like the car Christians. I don't see God as an object to be used. My prayer lives don't, don't consist of a list of things of, of that, that I want God to do for me. My prayer life does not consist of a list of things that I give God and say, here's to your to-do list for my life, Lord. This is what I want you to do for me. I'm not a donut car. I'm not a donut Christian, and my prayer life is not a car prayer. That's not how big my God is. My God is bigger than the donut. My God is bigger than the car. This is how big my God is. My God is as big as this gentleman right there. Does anyone know who he is? Joe, do you know who he is? <laughs> I figured you would. Um, he's the CEO of Ford, former CEO. So right, I saw the, the picture of the younger guy. This is God for me. He is, or the new guy, he owns it all. He owns the donut. He owns the car. He runs the whole, the whole enterprise, the, the manufacturing, everything. My God is bigger than the donut. My God is bigger than the car. My God is so big, so big that he doesn't know me. If he was sitting in the car with me, I wouldn't have a clue as to what to talk to him about, even if I worked for Ford. Our conversations would stay something like this. <clears throat> Did you see that we had snow this morning? Isn't Michigan odd? What else can I talk to him about? Man, what else can I talk to him? This is a really nice car. 
What else can I talk to him about? He is so powerful. I mean, if my car broke down, he can give me a new car. If, if he, he knows everything that I would need for my car. But I don't know him. He is so powerful, so big, so up there. Such a stranger. Our prayer life revealed to us who we see God to be in reality. You want to look at how you personally, how you view God, look at your prayer life. This series is called Powerful Prayer. And this morning, we're looking and asking the question, how big is my God? Is my God only for emergencies? Is my God only for what I want to do? Or is my God, the view of God is so powerful, so magnificent, but he's so out there that I don't really know what to talk to him about. And my prayer life shows it. I'll talk to God about the weather, I will talk to God about other people. I will talk to God about my wife, my children, my job, my finances, my bills. But I don't talk to him about me. How big is my God? There's one more. And I was praying, Lord, what, what picture to show? So this is the picture that I decided for a reason. Is God only for emergencies? Is God to get me to where I want to go? Is God so all-powerful and almighty, but a complete stranger? Or is God someone that I would love to take a long road trip with because of the relationship I have with him? And I picked Richard because if the, something were to happen with the car, Richard have a tool and he will know what to fix it. Maybe better than the CEO. Who is God to you? Your prayer life speaks loud and clear as to how big our God is. Does, does this help? Are you following so far? Yes? Are you with me? We're going to look at this in the disciples. This short little account in the Gospel of Mark embodies everything what we just talked about, the, the donut God, the car God, the CEO God, or the loving Father God. Where, are, where is my prayer? Who is my God? How big is he? Because it doesn't matter how much money he has to a little boy, to my little girl, if she were to ask, who do you want to ride in the car with, the CEO of Ford or Daddy, who is Gianna going to pick? Any day. I give really good kisses to her. I know to, to, how to tickle her. And I do wonderful things for her. I would color together. I read to her. I pray with her. Jenna sees my heart. And in her eyes, my heart is bigger than the CEO's power. Who is God to me? When I look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 40, it says... And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was lit already filling. And in the boat are the twelve disciples and Jesus, and Jesus has fallen asleep. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Wake up! These are seasoned Seamen, they're, they're, they're fishermen. They've been through storms. And through every storm, their own capacity, their own skills, their own tools allow them to survive the storm. But this storm that they are in right now, they are convinced this is it. And in their focus and in their investment, in trying to survive, to stay alive, to keep the water out as they're seeing the boat sink more and sink more and the waves get bigger and bigger. A flash of lightning goes off and they see Jesus on a pillow and God is sleeping. This is a prayer. 
Whenever a human being talks to God, it's a prayer. Whenever you and I talk to God, that's a prayer. We don't just pray when we are on our knees. Whenever we address God, that's a prayer, and this is a prayer. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? What does this prayer reveal about the size that God was to the disciples? There's more. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But Jesus looked at his disciples and said to them, Why are you so what? What emotion had overtaken them? Fearful. Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful with me on the boat? Why are you so fearful? Why, how is it that you have no what? Faith. And they feared exceedingly. It's actually interesting. They're more afraid now than during the storm. They fear exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? You tell me. When the disciples are crying out to Jesus... Wake up. Don't you care that we are perishing? I'm going to ask you this question. Did they wake Jesus up to calm the storm? How do we know that? Did they believe that Jesus could calm the storms? No. So my question to you is this morning, why wake him up? Why did they wake Jesus up for? Huh? Huh? For help. Jesus, here's an oar. Start rowing with us. Come on, my arms are burning. We need to take turns. It's your turn, Jesus. My arms are shot. It's that direction, Jesus. We are sailing in that direction. That's shoreline over there. Put all your muscles, Jesus. You can do this. You need to go to where we're going, and you need to do things the way we are doing them. That's why we are talking to you. That's why we woke you up. We woke you up so that you can struggle like us. We, we woke you up so that you can share in our fear. And we woke you up to tell you that how can you be asleep when we are about to perish? Right now, I don't think you love us too much. How big is our God? It's proportionate to how big we believe his heart is. Because we have two huge lessons here about prayer. The disciples are praying to Jesus, and their prayer is, don't you care? Don't you care? And when Jesus wakes up and sees what's going on, he says, peace, be still. And all the disciples are left with their oars in their hands like this. That's not what we were expecting. And now the, 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 the water is still. And all you hear is the dripping from them. And then Jesus looks at them and says, why were you so afraid? How could you not have faith? You've seen me feed 5,000 people. You've seen me heal the deaf. You've seen me give sight to the blind. You've seen me heal lepers. Did you think I had limits? Did you think that there are things I could not do? Are there things that you were afraid to ask me, my disciples? Has your faith limited my omnipotence? Because when it finishes, their words to each other is, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? What does it imply that the disciple says that even... What had the disciples done to the power of Jesus? He can heal the blind. Yes, Jesus can. He can heal the lepers. Yes, Jesus can. Can he he still storms and wind? No, 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 he can't do that. How big is your God? My prayer life reveals to me whether there are things I don't think I should pray about 
because I'm convinced there's nothing God can do about it. Is my God the size of a donut? Is my, my God the size of a car? Is my God the size of a CEO? Or when I pray, do, does my prayer life testify to me that when I direct my words to God, I see him as a God that is not just limitless in power, but limitless in his love for me. I want us to close this morning with a passage. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. We're going to see this passage through the series. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. For those of you that have been joining me in the mornings with uh, Facebook to pray, you've, you've heard me pray this. You've heard me put this promise before the Lord. This is what Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21 says. Now to him who is able, and who is him? Jesus. Now Jesus who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or do you believe that verse? Because this verse is a verse that takes our prayer lives and begins to stretch it. Your prayers are too tiny. Your prayers are too little. You're not praying to a God this size. Hebrews says, let us approach the throne of grace boldly. Jo Joe alluded to that in his prayer. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, not with donut prayers, not with car prayers, not with CEO prayers. We have a God that loves us. What we're reading is the ending thought of Paul, who is abundantly able to do above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works inside of us. To him, because this promise is available to every person, every human that prays to God, every church, every church member, this promise is for you. This promise is for you. This is for you to, when you go to pray to God, this is who you're praying to. To a God that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could even ask or imagine to ask. Should not that give us confidence when we pray? But you see, the CEO has a lot of power, but the CEO has no relationship. It is useless to believe in an all-powerful God if he is a CEO God that does not know me. The disciples, their limiting what God could do affected and limited how God could love. And in the moment of crisis, what they really believed about God, their prayer relieved, uh, uh, revealed. When they say to Jesus, to his face, don't you care we're perishing? So Paul, before he mentions this, before Paul points us, points our faith to the one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, before Paul points us to this omnipotent God, he points us to his heart. We're going to start reading in verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Faith. This is starting in verse 17, Ephesians 3, verse 17 through 21. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in what? A loving relationship. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, and pay attention to this, that Paul is saying, I, I'm praying that you will be able to understand, to grasp, to comprehend the width, the length, and depth, and height to know what? To know what? 
before Paul speaks about the limitless power of Christ, he speaks about his limitless love of Christ. The world may believe that God is all-powerful, but they look at the world and they misinterpret what happens. And so they come to the conclusion, why pray? Because he doesn't care about me. I'll just ask him to help me find my car keys. Apparently, that's all he cares about. So my prayers stay small. How big is your God? Who have you been praying to? That is your own testimony. And God doesn't want any of us, including me, to stay where we are in our prayer life. Amen? These passages are pushing us, stretching us, inviting us with the hope that we will grasp by faith, through faith, that we may know the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That is a paradox. To know something that passes knowledge. To know something that goes beyond our knowledge. That's why it says later on that he's able to do above all that we could ask or think. We have no idea how much God loves us. You have no idea how much God loves you. And when we pray, God wants us to come with the confidence, with the certainty that not only is he able to do it, in proportion to his limitless power is his limitless love for you. So when we pray, God, I mean, Jesus alluded to this when he tried to put the, the visible, tangible, and transpose it to the spiritual. Why do you worry about what you're going to wear and eat? Why do you worry about the things that the people that don't know me worry about? Worry about getting to know me. I don't want you to look at me just on crises. I don't want you to see me as someone that will help you with your agenda, your career, your academics, your relationships. Don't pray and ask me, Lord, make her fall in love with me. I'm not your car. I am not the God that will take you from point A to point B to the points that you want to go. I want to sit next to you and be a loving father that throughout the journey, our love will deepen. And throughout this journey, you will see not just what I am able to do for you, but what I am willing to do for you. There was a leprous, a leprous person that stood before Jesus and knelt before him. And I remember reading this in this book called Desire of Ages. I highly recommend it to you as a book about the life of Jesus. And this leper looks to Jesus and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. And as Jesus touches him, reaches out to touch him, he speaks these words. I am willing. I am willing. How big is your God, my brother and my sister? I asked God to confront me with this sermon, and this sermon has been in the making for the past two and a half months. As I've been praying and asking the Lord, Lord, I feel like I don't know how to pray. And I've been going to the word of God, asking the Lord, show me a prayer that measures up to who you are. Teach me to pray prayers that are proportionate to the God I am praying to. Not just in power, but your heart. God will take us through a journey through this series. But before we even embark... This morning, the Holy Spirit is asking us, what have we limited God in our own lives? What have we been afraid to bring to the Lord in prayer? Is it a marriage? I mean, what's the point of having a job if you don't have family? What's the point of losing, gaining, gaining the, like Jesus says, to, to gain the whole world but lose your soul or lose the people you love? The Holy Spirit and the Word of God this morning want all of us, 
when we pray to have the assurance we are speaking to one who loves us with an everlasting love. This narrative of the disciples reveals it. Jesus is startled out of sleep. And the first words he hears from the disciples is, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus looks about. He sees the storm. And what does Jesus do? He calms it. That's what Paul says to the one who is able to do abundantly above what we could ask or even think. He calms the storms. Then he looks at the disciples. He's already told them, why were you so fearful? Why did you not have faith? It's because you're limiting me. And you're not just limiting my power, you're limiting my love for you. How could I allow you to perish? How can I allow you to perish? How can my love for you allow me to neglect your needs? I hear your prayers, my child. I see your tears, my child. No tear is shed, but that the heart of God is moved. He sees you, and he loves you. Father in heaven, I want to thank you that this narrative in Mark doesn't beat around the bush. It gets to the heart of the issue. So, Father, before we leave this, your house, your presence, what have you convicted us of this morning? Who have I been praying to? Have my prayer life become just an emergency-based prayer, praying to a card donut God? Have I been telling you what to do for me? Do I feel, Lord, that you're so distant from me that you don't hear me? Or are you my Father in heaven, that when I pray, I know you listen? Not just that you listen, but Father, that you are answering, that you are answering each of our prayers. Help us believe, Lord, there's much more we need to say as we go through this series, Father. We will have plenty of things to think about, but today... Father, do not let us leave this place, your house of worship, praying to a God that is smaller than who you really are. I ask that through your spirit and your word that you would convict us. We can pray larger prayers. We can pray the prayers we have been afraid to ask. And Father, we can come with confidence. Because when we pray to you, we don't need merits. We have Jesus. He is our intercessor. And because of Jesus, we know our prayers are heard and our prayers are answered. Father, bless my church. Bless my friends. Bless all of us today with prayers that are proportionate to the God we are praying to. With prayers that are proportionate to your heart. It is in the name of Jesus who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above whatever we could ask or think. In his name, I pray and thank you. Amen, Lord. Amen. God bless you, my friends. I pray that I'll see all of you today at 6 o'clock as we continue with the series. Have a happy Sabbath.